Welcome to BSing with Sean K on Radio Free Brooklyn. I am your host, Sean Neese, and on this show, I interview people about their creative and intellectual passions and also people with perspectives on current events and political and social issues in the world. And this episode, I'm interviewing Dr. Amna Hussein, and this episode focuses on the current coronavirus pandemic. And I know recently I've interviewed a lot of people in the entertainment industry, uh, like artists, comedians, actors, and other people along those lines, but I thought it'd be good to do an episode that covers this issue because this is affecting everybody around the world at the same time and is something we all have in common. And my guest, Dr. Amna Hussein, has been on the local television here in New Jersey, and she's been asked a lot about the coronavirus and talks a lot about uh, different healthy habits people can adapt and gives advice for people who want to get through this crisis and also gives her knowledge as a, as a medical doctor on what what's going on right now. And she has a very calm, practical way of talking about it, which is good for people to hear right now because I know a lot of people are panicking right now. And I know sometimes the media can sensationalize things and it doesn't exactly help people with their stress. Right now, you know, doctors are on the front line. You know, they're they're essential workers, and they're risking their lives to make sure people are well and give them care. So I, I think it's it's good to acknowledge them during this time. Dr. Amna Hussein is a board certified pediatrician. She completed undergraduate training at Wolford college in South Carolina before moving back to her home state of North Carolina to complete medical school at East Carolina University's Brody School of Medicine. During medical school, Dr. Hussein completed additional coursework for focus on food literacy, nutrition, and health from ECU. She went on to complete her pediatric residency at Georgetown University Hospital in Washington, D.C., from early on in her path to becoming a physician, Dr. Hussein knew she wanted to work with children. At her private practice in Marlboro, New Jersey, she offers a wide spectrum of services for young children, including acute and non-acute sick and well care visits, physical examinations, minor procedures, and lactation services for mothers. She's not only a fellow of the American Academy of Pediatrics, but is also a member of the AAP's section on breastfeeding and serves the community as a lactation consultant. She has been featured on Babyless, Care.com, Parentology, Romper, What to Expect, and News 12. And also, we, we I think it's fitting that we recorded this interview on Zoom, because Zoom has been gaining a lot of popularity lately. Because now that people can't meet in person, they're having a lot of events over Zoom. I've been to two Zoom events. And uh, it, it, it takes some getting used to just meeting with people on a screen and you're on a bunch of different screens. But, you know, it's a way to stay connected during this time of social distancing. And without further delay, here's my interview with Dr. Amna Hussein, and I hope you enjoy it. So I have Dr. Amna Hussein joining me, and she's a pediatrician, and you've been on News 12 to talk about uh, the coronavirus and ways people can uh, manage and healthy habits and mm-hmm. 
so I guess just elaborate on that and tell us, you know, about yourself and uh, how you first became familiar with Corona and everything. Sure. So, um, so I am a pediatrician. I'm in New Jersey. I own my own practice, Pure Direct Pediatrics. I'm also a lactation consultant. Um, I am pretty active as a physician on social media. Um, I think it's a great way to connect with patients, gain patients, educate, um, especially when you have so much fake news floating around. Um, I'd like to hear it straight from the source. I'd like to hear it straight from the doctor. So um, I first kind of became more vocal on the platform a little over a year ago, I think. Um, maybe Actually, maybe a little under a year ago. And um, my content sparked um, the eyes and ears of others, and including producers from TV shows, um, news outlets, and magazines. So that's how I've kind of started to be featured as more of a medical expert. And um, really, when this pandemic took off, um, nobody saw it the way it was, where it was going or how it was going to start. We actually weren't sure how it would turn. Would it be SARS? Would it be H1N1? Would it be swine flu? We just weren't sure how it would play out. Um, certainly, we've seen coronaviruses in the past. I'm very familiar with viruses as a pediatrician, including coronaviruses. This is, of course, a novel coronavirus, and so no one's really seen it or been exposed to it. And um, essentially, as I mentioned, it just so happened that as people have begun asking more questions, they have been looking for a medical expert to really answer them. And um, the opportunity really aligned nicely because being in New Jersey, I'm in a hot spot. Um, I, there's a lot more coronavirus around here. There's a lot more COVID-19 around here in New York, in New Jersey, in Connecticut than there are in other parts of the country. And um, I think I'm, I think any really spreading of knowledge and facts and science is is better than fake news. So um, it's just kind of really blossomed from there. And um, being a physician, whether I'm a pediatrician, um, it doesn't matter. It matters in terms of understanding science and understanding medications, understanding how the human body works to really understand how this is affecting healthcare. And you mentioned swine flu and SARS, which was uh, mm -hmm. another epidemic uh, a while back, like several years back, I, I believe. Right. And um, so in what ways does this compare to SARS or the swine flu and other epidemics we've had, pandemics we've had in the past? Sure. Um, so just to explain the difference between epidemic and pandemic. So an epidemic would be an outbreak in a certain region. So think about Ebola, right? So Ebola was an outbreak just a few years ago during the Obama presidency, but it really was mostly contained um, versus a pandemic, pan meaning widespread, right? So it's over and prevalent through an many, many different continents versus just Africa as the Ebola outbreak was. So um, the reason why this is a pandemic is because exactly as I've said, we're seeing this go from South Asia, um, East Asia, into Europe, into South America, into North America, Canada, really New Zealand, no corner, no continent, except maybe Antarctica, I don't know, is really safe here. Um, so that's really the difference between epidemic and pandemic. Now, why does it make it really different? A couple of things. So the body has never, the human body hasn't really seen this coronavirus before, right? So when we have talk about the flu every year, the flu shot is different. We um, anticipate some changes. It does mutate ever so slightly. We account for those mutations. We create a new flu shot every year. Sometimes it's more effective than other years, but you will likely have some degree of some immunity that once you get the flu shot, that confers for the flu of the season. The novel coronavirus is not that way, right? We've never really seen something like it. It takes some time to understand the proteins. It takes some time to understand what the setup is, what it's causing, what the disease process is before we can start thinking about vaccines and medications to combat it. So that's one way why it's different from... Um, from the regular flu. Another way is um, seasonality, right? So we usually see SARS or um, H1N1 or the flu spread, you know, about October through April is really the flu season here. 
we're not really seeing the seasonality change so much with COVID-19. Another thing is growth. Um, it really grows exponentially. It's highly transmissible. You know, we're careful about saying it is droplet transmission. It's person to person. It's really only airborne. We think in the hospitals where you do procedures that could aerosolize it. But the growth, right? We started with one case, I think, in New Jersey in um, the first week of March, I believe. And then it just it grew exponentially, just like we've seen in New York. And it is now in the end of April plateauing. So we really play catch up and we really suffer while we're playing that catch up with this virus that grows so fast. And now, lastly, think about what SARS or um, MERS, like the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome virus, they did. Well, SARS kind of burnt itself out before it really even gave us a chance to develop a vaccine. It really went away with MERS, the Middle East Respiratory Virus that hit um, a few years ago. There really weren't even enough cases to warrant a vaccine. So zero for two, COVID-19 or the SARS-CoV-2 virus really takes both of those down. We're seeing a much higher number of cases, right? So over a million affected across the, across the world. Um, we're seeing that this is probably going to be with us for some time, right? Definitely through the summer, definitely likely for a few years to come, a virus that has this robust of response in, um, on the human population doesn't just go away. It's probably going to be with us next year too. And that's what you're seeing um, states and governments planning for is how are we going to equip ourselves to be ready for the second wave and future waves of COVID-19. So are the precautions we're taking now effective or is there more we need to do to prevent the spread? Um, that's a really good question. So I think they are effective actually. I do think they're effective. Um, they I think if we could grade how effective each one is, I certainly physical distancing, and I, I want to say physical versus social because we're seeing just a lot of mental health with people feeling isolated. So social distancing doesn't mean social isolation. Social distancing at this point, we're talking about physically distancing yourself. That has helped so rapidly. As much as we all hate working from home or not being able to go out, it is really helping to flatten the, this curve and really break the back of it. Um, we think masks have helped in some ways with the universal masking, whether it be that we are protecting others from our droplets or it's just reminding us not to touch our nose and mouth. It seems to be helping hand washing. Hand washing is like key. It always has been. It is the king of really hygiene, whether you are without medications with medications in a third world country, good soap and water can really help you to prevent a lot of diseases, viruses, or bacteria. And those three things are so important. Now, the other measures that we're trying to do really help the healthcare population, right? So having PPE, trying to stay out of hospitals if not necessary, trying to put off elective procedures, that definitely helps on the, um, the kind of outbreak response method. So trying to make sure that we're keeping things at a low census for our hospitals to really accommodate for sick patients. I think everything we're doing right now is really great. And then I think the only thing we can continue to do is just educate populations wisely on what we know and what we don't know. So for example, yesterday um, I was asked, you know, hey, the WHO put out this, this um, paper in the statement that said, well, we just don't know if the antibodies are going to help you forever. We don't know if this is the immunity card, the passport that you're looking for. And, you know, does that mean bad news, Dr. Hussein? I don't think that means bad news. I think that I commend them on saying the truth, what we know and what we don't. And that's exactly the truth. We don't know the degree of immunity. We don't know the duration of immunity, right? So immunity can last one month, three months, six months, a year, lifelong, we don't know if it's partial. We don't know if it's complete. And I think it's really important. I'm not saying that we should crush hopes, but I'm saying we shouldn't falsely raise hopes either. That, well, just as long as you get your antibodies, you're free to do whatever you want. Nope. We should really make sure that we're trying to limit risky behavior right now with the truth and acknowledging what we do know and what we don't know. So it might take a long time for them to come up with a vaccine or a way to treat this 
Well, um, I think what we're hearing is that maybe treatments will come out before vaccines. Certainly remdesivir, the treatment that we've heard about for Ebola is helping. Um, There's other treatments that I'm sure you've heard about in the news, right? Hydroxychloroquine or azithromycin. We don't really have enough really good data for that, um, to be quite honest. But certainly, I think the medications um, might come out before the um, the vaccine does. I think testing does help a lot. Universal testing does help to um, tell us, okay, you have the virus, you need to isolate yourself. Okay, you don't have the virus, go home, continue to watch, you seem to be okay, you can still maybe make grocery runs if you want, continue to shelter at home versus that sick person who you don't want them going anywhere. Now, with the vaccine, definitely. This has to be something, I'm, as a pediatrician, I'm really um, I'm passionate about vaccinations. I think they need to be done safely, they need to be done cautiously, and they need to be um, effective, right? Um, first of all, you never want to put anything in your body if it's not safe with any medication, right? That's why doctors are so big on the hydroxychloroquine. Hey, 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 don't jump to hydroxychloroquine. It's a medication that has side effects. We really got to be careful about using this. And that's the same way where we are with vaccines. So we want to make sure the product we put out is safe. So that's why it's going to take, you know, 12 to 18 months possibly to see this. So um, certainly I think that's going to be our long-term Um, solution to this. And it might be a vaccine that needs to be, um, you know, corrected every year, just like the flu vaccine is maybe who needs to have slight slight tweaks. It's just too early to say. I think though that we're making good headway. We really are. We want to make sure that we're doing everything in a safe method though. So what more could the government be doing to help? Um, So we talked briefly about testing. I think, um, I think our government could be, you know, if we're talking about federal government, could be doing more to really coordinate with that. You know, um, it's kind of being left up to states. And um, and that's difficult, right? Some states, you've heard of Georgia reopening, and they're really not even doing a large amount of tests. Um, some states like New York and New Jersey who have bigger funds, they are able to get more testing, but it's certainly putting them at a risk of running dry. Um, this is really a... It's a very discoordinated effort if you take a step backward and look at the forest and not the trees, right? We're all looking at the trees in our own state and like, can we get this test? Can we get that? Where can I get the testing done? But if you take a step backward, I think this could be coordinated a lot better from a federal government standpoint. I think certainly um, the PPE could be coordinated in a much better method. Now, certainly I do acknowledge this hit everybody in a different way, right? We never knew in February that we would be dealing with something on the ordinance of this. But I think in the future waves, if they were to happen going forward, I think the government could help a lot more with coordinating PPE, with coordinating testing, supplies, um, making sure that there are contact tracers out there, right? We've talked about if someone gets sick, well, that person needs to be traced and traced backwards and, um, Make sure that we are not, we're letting them know early on, but that takes human and manpower. So that needs to be there somehow. And right now the states are depending on, on themselves to find contact tracers and fill these jobs. And then lastly, opening, right? Reopening, closing the country was crazy, right? It was kind of like one state shuts down and then another state shuts down. And then, and then the federal government said, everybody shut down. And now everybody's kind of like turning on the lights in a different, a different part of the country. You know, Georgia's turning them on. Texas is turning them on. Um, California has some parts turned on. Florida has some parts, you know, that they're trying to open up. New York and New Jersey are still clamped down. Um, I think this could definitely be coordinated in a much better method. And I'm not saying that if the federal government were to say it, that all states would comply, but I'm certainly feel that um, the healthcare industry in the healthcare field especially in Georgia, I feel like it really hurts to be a doctor right now. We're seeing the cases go up and up and up in, in Georgia. And here on the other side of it, we have the governor opening up. Um, it, it, you know, we're not on a, we're not on a hamster wheel here. Um, doctors are subject to burnout as well. And um, as you've heard of that really, um, really recent suicide of a physician, an ER doctor in New York, um, you know, our, our work matters, our lives matter, our work um lifestyle matters. So I think we really need to be coordinated and safe about how to do this. 
Um, the economy matters, but I, I really believe that um, economic health can't be achieved without personal health first. So they were reopening a bit too abruptly, I guess is what you're saying, rather than considering it more. I think so. I think, um, and I'm not saying every state. I definitely feel like New York and New Jersey and Connecticut and Massachusetts and Rhode Island, all these states who are deciding to form a coalition, that is an incredibly intelligent thing to do because we live literally just like a hop skip away. And if New York has open restaurants and New Jersey doesn't, how does that help anybody? Everything has to be coordinated, right, to some degree. And I think um, these states who are choosing to open, they're saying it, they're basing it off their data. Um, the president is openly disagreeing. And I know the healthcare professionals are disagreeing. The CDC, who's based in Georgia, is disagreeing. Um, unless, you know, the governor knows something that the rest of us don't, I do think it, I think it is a little early. And I think that second wave is going to be difficult. It's definitely going to be difficult to close down a business once you've reopened, right? And that's the last thing you really want to do. So is it still uh, mainly elderly, elderly people at risk or young people equally at risk or wh um, which, uh, that's a really good question. You know, I've been talking about this virus for close to six to eight weeks, really, almost eight weeks now. And we came in saying the elderly, the immunocompromised, those are going to be the people who are the most um, at risk. And certainly, I do think and I still believe they are at the highest risk of dying or having a fatality to COVID. But can anybody get the virus? You bet. Anybody can get the virus. Um, you can get you can have a really a range of symptoms though. So you could have the virus and be completely asymptomatic, Sean, and really have no symptoms, nothing. Or you could end up with a mild head cold, or you could end up with like fevers and shakes and you feel like you have the worst flu of your life. Or you could end up with shortness of breath and be intubated. That's the really crazy thing. We doctors are saying you could see somebody with the flu across the room when they walk in, right? You kind of have an idea. But with COVID, it's very hard. Um, you could have GI symptoms, vomiting and diarrhea, and you could be an elderly person with that or a young person. And I think the newest data, which is kind of alarming for me as a physician, is seeing the, um, the possibility of strokes in young populations, right? Um, I talked about this briefly, but the median age of strokes is 74 years of age. Usually people who have strokes have heart disease, they have high cholesterol, um, some young people who have substance abuse can have strokes, right? But COVID-19 can cause problems with their clotting and activate clotting factors. And that can cause strokes in very young people. And we're seeing that 30s, 40s, 50s. And as a physician, that's scary. That's alarming to me. Um, so I'm all about educating, right? What are the symptoms you need to know for a, a stroke? And know that time is of the essence, right? We want, Even though we want you to stay out of the hospital, if you need to go to the hospital, go to the hospital. Do not be so afraid of COVID that you miss getting treatment for a stroke or a heart attack. So I guess that's what makes this unique compared to other yeah. yeah absolutely it does it does i mean i uh, there's some viruses that can cause you to have a range of symptoms right um certainly some people say that measles oh it's okay I'll, it'll just be um, a little head cold a little rash and that's it but no measles that virus can also cause you to have really severe brain infections as well um they can, it can also kill you. And that's why we're so crazy about vaccination as pediatricians for something that's so highly transmissible. Well, COVID-19 is somewhat like that, where it's not as highly transmissible as measles, right? Um, but it can really have a range of symptoms. So that's why we're so crazy about try to shelter at home if you can, hand hygiene, wear masks if you have to go out, practice social distancing, be smart. Um, and I wish that... Um, you know, I understand that cabin fever right now is meeting spring fever, and it's just, it's it's really hard. I get it. I'm a mother to a young child, and I wish that it was nicer weather and we could go for a walk. I wish I could go out for an outing as well. I wish we could go to the park. She loves going to the grocery store. I wish I could do that too. But um, I think if we realize that the short term, like, you know, small losses we're taking right now will really help in the long term, um, that, that, really methodology and that belief will really help us, I think. So uh, as a doctor, have you come across uh, many patients that have gotten uh, 
gotten this condition yet or? Yeah. Um, I do. I have a handful of patients. So I'm a pediatrician. Um, I, children luckily are not as likely to be severely ill. There have been pediatric deaths related to COVID in this country. Certainly there have a handful. Um, and every loss is, is heartbreaking. It's sad because children are resilient, right? They don't usually have all those problems that people talk about diabetes and heart disease and lung disease, and they're not smokers. They should be healthy. They should be able to fight this off. And for the most part, they are, they really are. So the children who I've seen with it, um, I have been able to keep them at home, monitor them at home, and they've been able to recover. Um, I have had a handful of adult friends um, and colleagues who've gotten ill, and they haven't fared as well. Um, some of them have had to go to the hospital. Some of them have had to be intubated. Some of them have lost their lives or lost their loved ones. Um, certainly a New Jersey hospital right here in northern New Jersey ha has lost six doctors to date. And that's a big number. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I think that it's certainly, um, it's eye-opening, right? Um, we definitely, we, we practice all that we preach, especially with hand washing, but we never want to be vectors of the disease that we're trying to treat. And that's why PPE is so important, right? Yeah. And so you, you've been meeting with patients in person or how's that? Yeah, so good question. Um, I have a very unique practice in that um, patients already kind of get direct access to me. Um, they call me, they text me, they email me whenever they want. I also do, um, in addition to office visits, home visits. And that was before COVID started. Now with COVID, um, I am trying to prioritize home visits so that if families need to be seen, they're still allowed to shelter at home. And um, I have the proper PPE to see them then. Now, secondly, um, I'm doing a little bit more texting medicine, right? So if families text me or call me at night, I'm able to talk them through. However, my field's very interesting, right? I don't have 30-year-old, 40-year-old patients who say, well, it hurts here, doc. You kind of have to see your patients in person to know exactly what's going on. They're not going to tell you they're having difficulty breathing. They're not going to tell you where it hurts. You kind of have to examine them. And that's where um, I think in pediatrics, telemedicine and remote medicine can become a little difficult. Um, so with my older patients, I think telemedicine is a great um, opportunity and a great thing that we can take a look at. But with other avenues, I think that... Um, it's important to really rule out certain things, right? Um, just because it's COVID doesn't mean your stomach pain isn't appendicitis. And, um, and that's where your doctor really comes in to make sure that everything's okay. Um, so I am still seeing patients. Um, it's a mix of texting medicine, it's a mix of office-based medicine, and it's a mix of home visits. And I guess, but I guess children are the least at risk with this? Right. Um, we definitely think that people who are um, healthier seem to be doing better. So, you know, um, the younger adults do do better. Sure, they can end up intubated. I agree. And that's a big deal. But they might not be the ones who fall ill and died like our elderly citizens. They may have a higher rate of recovery. Now, children as well, they're resilient. They are less likely to end up in the hospital from this with severe complications and that means, though, that you still have to check in on them, make sure that they're, they're okay every day, that they're sick. But um, they, they seem to be faring better. And there's a couple of different theories out there for that. One, we think that, as I've mentioned, children are a little better. They don't have as many of those awful diseases that adults have, right? Smoking and lung disease and heart disease, obesity, diabetes, other things. We think the virus affects a receptor that children don't quite have developed yet. Thirdly, we believe that, as I've mentioned, coronavirus is a family of viruses. The SARS-CoV-2 virus is the one that causes COVID-19. It's just one of them. Children are petri dishes of viruses, right? So maybe they have some cross immunity from other coronaviruses. So those are some of the different theories that have been played and tossed around. Certainly, um, you know, my field is children. If it's a young infant, so we're talking about anywhere less than like one year of age, those children do potentially, they can do worse when they contract it. And there's a couple of reasons why. Um, they're small, they don't have as robust of an immune system. They, um, 
have smaller lungs, smaller respiratory reserve. They're less likely to be able to tell you when they're getting ill. When they do get ill, um, they have less um, really reserve to be able and muscle reserve and, and to be able to drink and stay hydrated and to eat and to take care of themselves when they get sick. And on one, in one video I saw you talked about how, uh, people who have, uh, relatives that are there, there might be a risk with uh, people who have relatives that are mm -hmm. elderly in mm -hmm. nursing homes and. Uh, yeah. Yeah. So nursing homes are, um, another ball game altogether and a very complex and a very, very sad ball game, I feel like, to be honest with this virus, because we know the populations that are most vulnerable and long term care facilities are filled with them. These people have, uh, or they're elderly, your immune system isn't functioning at its tip top prime when you're older. You um, have other diseases, like I've already hit on in the past hypertension heart disease, diabetes, you might not be moving as much. Um, they can get sick and it takes them a lot longer to get better. So once it gets into the long-term care facilities or nursing homes, they can really spread very quickly. And um, a lot of people have asked me, well, should I be pulling my, my family member out? And that's a very hard question to answer, right? I, I, I can't make that decision for you personally. Um, the thing about when you pull a when you pull your grandma out, you have to think: Is grandma going to be in the house then with um, her granddaughter, who's a nurse, or grandkids who are young playing outside and then coming back in? Maybe grandma needs to have help to have baths and go up and down the stairs. Well, is somebody able to give her baths? Is somebody able to spoon feed her her meals and get her up and down the stairs? Those are all like really important questions that you need to think about before you make such a drastic decision to do that. Um, another really, really, really um, important thing to bring to mind is our elderly citizens with age, they can get demented. They can get um, cognitive delays. They can they really depend on familiarity, Sean. So they depend on that same person who's their caregiver, that same person who sits with them at breakfast, the same meal, the same routines. We have showers at this time. Then we play, you know, this at this time. And then we read a book at this time. Now, if you're moving around your elderly citizens, oh, someone's been quarantined here. We need to move the patients off to this side of the ward that really does mess up their routine. Or their um, helper, their aide gets sick and then there's a new aide who comes in. They may not really recognize that person as much, right? They're, they have some behavioral then changes. They, don't, they act out because they're not used to that aide. Or you bring them into your home and they're not used to your home because they're so used to their long-term care facility. So those are all really important things to know about before you make that decision. And it should be something that's really weighed and, um, and thought out carefully. So are they, are they taking precautions in nursing home? Like, are they, are they keeping the patients uh, far apart from each other? And yeah, yeah, they are actually. So they are, um, they are also now before any of us turn to universal masking, which was, I think a few weeks ago, long-term care facilities. I know in New Jersey did begin universal masking. I think a week or 10 days before any of anything else, really any of us started wearing masks. And that was because, hey, maybe the nursing aides who are in the long-term care facilities are asymptomatic carriers. Let's have them wear masks. They're wearing gloves. We are trying to isolate patients who test positive. We are trying to, and now recently, because so many long-term care facilities have been hit, we are having mandated reporting to the state and to the government for anybody who tests positive in a long-term care facility. And I guess you should be careful visiting like elderly relatives in general. Like right. This, and yeah. I think that's a really good point to bring up too. Bef when before really any of this um, lockdown really took off, we started doing more of a lockdown on nursing homes. So the people who were going in and out, one visitor only could be a direct family member and you had to have your temperature taken before you could go in. And, um, and even now they've even cracked down even further. Some, some of them are not allowing visitors. Um, and that's heartbreaking and it's awful. And it's a very difficult situation. I think long-term care facilities are its own really, um, 
a whole new territory with this virus. Um, and I think as many measures as we can take, um, I hope they're enough. I really do. And you talked a bit about like the healthy habits people should adapt. Uh, I guess like what are the do's and don'ts of like what people should do to stay sure. healthy? Sure. So um, that's a really good question. One thing I want to tell people is this is not the time. And I've never really been a fan of people saying, I'm going to boost my immune system. I'm going to do a detox. Okay. You don't need to boost your immune system. You don't need to detox unless you're like a heavy drinker or something. Your immune system is fine. There are certain things you can do to help it. And I'm going to lay them out for you. None of them require you to go buy a special drink or a special tea or do a cleanse. They're all very simple things. So first, and I stay with science and facts and data. So things that we have sleep, right? There are studies that show that less than six hours of sleep can really affect NK cells in our immune system, very strong um, and components of our immune system. So make sure you're getting enough sleep. Okay. Um, this is not the time that you stay up till, 3 a.m. because you don't, you know, let's say our children are staying up till 3 a.m., 2 a.m. because they don't have to go to school and then they're sleeping until 1. No, you should try to still keep a regular sleep schedule as best as you can. Two, make sure you are eating a balanced diet, right? Um, in this country, it is very hard to get vitamin deficiencies because we are, have access to such great food items, produce, multivitamins, you name it, we could get it, fruits, versus other um, underserved areas of the world. We, overall, if we eat a balanced diet, we will hit all the bells and whistles that we need to. You don't need to take mega doses of vitamin C and mega doses of um, vitamin A and D. You just need to make sure you're eating a balanced diet. Um, make sure you take a multivitamin. Um, also, make sure you're staying hydrated right? All of those things are really important. Exercise, okay? Exercise is very, very important because there is, um, there is evidence and studies that some, some um, physical stress on the body like that can help your immune system. It helps you to really not only your mental health, but your physical health. And all of us are sitting around right now. We have nothing better to do than go get some form of exercise in. Lastly, um, so all these unhealthy habits that we've hit on, right? So smoking, drinking, which we all know pick up during the time of stress, those really do weaken your immune system. They really do. So this would be the time that I really strongly advise you, quit smoking, try to cut back on drinking. They do impact your immunity negatively. And lastly, um, anxiety and stress. Um, those that really feeds full circle into what we talked about sleep. It can affect your sleep quality. It can affect your health. It can affect your mental health as well, not just your physical health. So try your best, try your best to keep your anxiety under control, whether that be yoga, whether that be a walk with your dog, whether that be fresh air twice a day for 15 minutes, whatever that may be. Um, there's lots of apps that help with meditation. You do whatever makes you happy. Um, for some that's baking, for some that, you know, is watching a movie, whatever you want to do, but don't keep the news on incessantly in the background, um, especially if you feel like it's really affecting your mental health. And all of those will help you do your best and have a well-rounded immune system. Um, I've heard a couple of people worry that, am I washing my hands too much? Will that affect my immunity? Well, no, it won't because you're right. There are some certain level of germs that we all need to be exposed to. But my argument for that is look at your doctors. Your doctors wash their hands before they see you, after they see you. We all wash our hands before we eat. We all wash our hands when we leave the bathroom. I wash my hands as soon as I come in from outdoors because, you know, I don't know what I've been touching, you know, or if you fill in gas, then touch your steering wheel. You don't know who's touched that. You should just be practicing good hand hygiene at the appropriate times and your immune system will still be fine. You don't need to go lick a Petri dish to boost, bolster your immune system. So I guess before we wrap up, uh, anything you'd like to add, maybe like, uh, I guess a hopeful message to the world, yeah. if there is any. Yeah, and I think one important thing to mention, I know everybody is feeling, um, I don't even want to call it stress. Um, I almost think it's trauma because there is, there's a, some degree of trauma to us all. Um, doctors, nurses, 
anybody who has had a patient who or who a family member who's had COVID and you don't really get to see them when they're in the hospital or if you've lost your job and you're still waiting on your unemployment to come in or if you're a mother and you are constantly just pulling out your hair trying to homeschool, everybody has some degree of trauma or you're mourning the way your life used to be. I never thought I would miss going to Whole Foods with my daughter because she used to enjoy it so much. Um, I never thought I'd miss it. Everybody is having some degree of trauma. And what I can say right now is the best thing to remember is how to keep your mental health as sane and as healthy as possible. One would be, we're all on social media. Don't compare yourself to others. Don't compare yourself to Keith, who seems to be running a marathon. And here you are, you're having trouble getting off the couch. Don't compare yourself to Karen, who's homeschooling her kids. And she is just flying through this period. And she seems to have everything lined up. And it's everybody has their own problems that they're working with. So comparison is the thief of joy. Don't fall into the comparison trap. Secondly, really focus on the things that do make you happy. In a time where everything feels canceled, think about what's not canceled, right? So gyms are closed, but your exercise is not canceled. You can still go for a walk. You can still go for a run. You can still lift weights, still pop in an exercise DVD. Yeah, movie theaters are closed, but you can still listen to music, podcasts, audiobooks, movie nights in the house. You know, um, I know that you're not able to do the same things that you used to, but focus on the things you can do. Um, humanity is not canceled. Laughter is not canceled. Um, all of those things. And then my biggest takeaway when I practice medicine, even with pediatrics, is be proactive, not retroactive. Don't wait for a problem to happen before you act on it. So don't wait until you think, I'm depressed. I'm hurting. I feel anxious. I can't go to sleep before you start leaping around for the phone numbers or a friend to call. Be positive. Connect early. Write down the numbers for your state's mental health, your crisis text line. Write them down. Put them in a drawer. Put them on the fridge if you need to. And act early rather than waiting for yourself to feel like you're really, truly down in the dumps. And just know we can get through this together. Everybody has some degree of trauma. Check in on your neighbors. Check in on your friends. And check in on yourself, too. So I guess would you say like the, there's a correlation between like good mental health and good physical health? Can they yeah, affect each absolutely. other? Absolutely, absolutely, absolutely. I do, I do believe in that um, that mind body connection. Um, if you are think about it this way, if you're struggling with low self confidence, you will never feel confident enough to really put out your best work and talk about your best work, right? And it affects your performance with your job. It affects your performance with anything. Um, your family life, your work life, same thing. It's the mind-body balance. So if you are not taking care of yourself mentally, you're feeling down, you're feeling depressed, what's going to make you get off the couch and go make yourself a home-cooked healthy meal? Or get off the couch and go work out? Not much. So put yourself in the right positive mindset and you will realize that everything will slowly fall into place. And it might not be the place that you imagined March 1st, but it's going to be a new level of norm. And we will get through this. This is not going to be forever. So where can people find you or like keep updated with, uh, sure. I guess, like your appearances, like on TV or wherever else you talk about this? Sure. Um, so, uh, Instagram is a great place. So my Instagram handle is at dr period Amna Hussein, A M N A H U S A I N. Um, I'm usually available through DMS there. I, um, do post some content there as well as on Facebook. So Facebook, um, I'm always available directly, um, at pure direct pediatrics. So P U R E direct D I R E C T pediatrics with an S. And both of those are great places to find me, um, to learn more about what I do. I, personally, I just wrapped up a series on Instagram for kids behavior and parents, um, you know, guiding through how to really react to your kids re um, behaviors at this time and how to take care of your own mental health as a parent through this. Well, thank you very much for coming on. I know you're, you have a, you're real busy with everything going on. So uh, thank you oh, for taking no time problem. out to come on here and, you know, tell us, give us some helpful information and everything. No problem. No problem. Thank you for having me. And I hope you stay healthy and I hope you stay well. Yeah. Same, same to you. I hope you stay healthy and well too. And, uh, Thanks. Yeah.
Well, uh, have yeah, have a good day. Bye. You too. You're listening to BSing with Sean K on Radio Free Brooklyn. That was my interview with Dr. Amna Hussein. I hope what you found what she said insightful and helpful. And definitely I agree with her what she said, like social distancing doesn't have to mean social isolation. You know, there's Zoom events, you know. I'm glad I got started with this radio station around this time. I mean, I've been doing this show as a podcast for a while, but it gives me something weekly to do. And then I'm still like part of a community in a way, even though I'm still just doing the show from home. Also, giving up certain things short term, like staying in, even though that might, you know, the economy might be hurt in some ways is better than the pandemic breaking out and more people getting infected. And it's just, it's just temporary. It's not going to be forever. And, you know, even little things like today, I went for a walk and I got takeout food, you know. Uh, I think it's good to do that sometimes at least. Like mainly I've been cooking at home, but, you know, to support especially local small restaurant chain, restaurant businesses, because otherwise, you know, they're going to go under if people don't still order takeout. And, and just like that interaction of ordering something from the clerk at the counter and just, the, just that human interaction, even in a small way like that, helped me feel connected during this time. And she mentioned like movie night, doing things like movie night to stay busy. Actually, me and my housemate did that last night. We watched uh, The Lighthouse, which is a really good movie. I really liked it. It's this black and white horror film that's loosely based off an Edgar Allan Poe story. And in a way, it kind of relates to Corona because it's these two guys that are working on this lighthouse This that's like on an isolated island far away from civilization. And then it's sort of the main character's descent into madness. And it's like all these weird David Lynch-like visual effects and everything. And it's it's pretty out there. I really, I really liked it a lot, but it, it, it's it's showed like an extreme case of people going crazy because they're just isolated with each other in this small space, and they didn't really get along too well to begin with. So hopefully, there's not too many of those situations going on right now with Corona. I know there's a lot of divorces because of this because people are just stuck together for more hours than they were before. So maybe married couples should watch Lighthouse now to see if if they they think they could handle that or if they think they turn out like William Defoe's character and the other character. Another thing is I wanted to say is that yeah, like I mentioned, you know, like doctors they're putting themselves on the line doc and other healthcare staff. I mean, I know she she mainly works with children, but like like she said in the interview, even she's getting patients. And obviously she's very informed about this topic. And also, like, food service staff and grocery store employees, people that kind of, people kind of took what they did for granted, too, before this crisis. Like, I I know that, you know, when, when I used to work at, Stop and shop, like many many years ago. I know it was Shoprite. Uh, I remember just like the way the customers would treat the staff, and you know I still see it the way they mistreat uh, waiters or, and you know I, I think this. Hopefully, this situation will get people to value their service a little more and not treat them like crap and get on that power trip because I just hate that. I'm just grateful that I'm more fortunate right now than a lot of people are. I know I am. And the acting, because a lot of you know that I'm also an actor, has has taken a back, has been put on the back burner for now, obviously, because they aren't shooting as many things. I have been submitting to voiceover and voice acting work because I can still do, like, animated projects or like voice acting projects from home because I have equipment to record with. And I, I wrote a script actually that I'm going to get people together to shoot. It's like a five minute short film. 
and I have a role I wrote for myself in there too. But you know, I'm I'm still working on different creative projects. This and also getting back into doing music again. And you know, I I know it's not a productivity contest, but it's hard to. I'm I'm sure a lot of people can relate to this. Like even now, like I feel like I should be doing something productive and I know we have a lot of time on our hands but it's like it's hard to it's hard for me to just you know I, I don't feel good if I just sit and like I, I'll watch like a show all day like I, I need to be accomplishing something but but I, I at the same time you know just getting through this coronavirus I think is an accomplishment So before we wrap up, I do have some announcements to make regarding Radio Free Brooklyn. If you'd like to listen to Radio Free Brooklyn when you're not in front of your computer, please consider downloading our free mobile app for both iPhone and Android. It's available in the App Store for iPhone or the Google Play Store for Android. And you can also listen to past episodes of BSing with Sean K. Or other shows on there too as well. If you don't catch them when they air. And regarding our newsletter. Please sure to, be sure to subscribe to our monthly newsletter. For the latest news about new programming and upcoming Radio Free Brooklyn events. You can sign up at RadioFreeBrooklyn.org slash newsletter. Now, for COVID-19, we're doing a fundraiser. Uh, So friends, COVID-19 is disrupting everyone's lives right now. And Radio Free Brooklyn is no exception. We want you to know that we have made every effort to ensure that the health and well-being of our hosts, staff, and community at large... We want you to know that we have made every effort to ensure the health and well-being of our host, staff, and community at large. We've closed both our studios and canceled live events, but our hosts are still doing their best to continue bringing new original programming by broadcasting live and pre-recording from their home studios, or by selecting the best rebroadcasts of their best shows, of their past shows. With our revenue streams evaporated, we need your help. And we realize you may be hurting too, but if you can afford a small donation, it would go a long way toward helping us stay on the air. There are three ways you can help. First, you can give a one-time or monthly donation by going to RadioFreeBrooklyn.org slash donate. There you'll find some great t-shirts, mugs, and other swag that we'd like to send you to say thanks. You can also use your phone to text RFB give five. That's the number five, not the word five. RFB GIVE five to four four three two one. It only takes a moment and you'll be able to use your digital wallet for your donation. Finally, if you shop on Amazon, you can go to amazon.com slash smile. You know, like a yes, yeah, smile, and uh, register Radio Free Brooklyn as the nonprofit you wish to support. When you do, a percentage of your sales will go to Radio Free Brooklyn, and it will cost you nothing. Seriously, it'll cost you nothing. Go try it now. Amazon.com/smile and choose Radio Free Brooklyn. No donation is too big or too small. Whatever you can afford will make a huge difference. We thank you from the bottom of our hearts and wish all our listeners health and happiness as we weather this storm together. Okay, that's all the uh, on-air reads. Thank you again for listening to Radio Free Brooklyn. Your support keeps this station going. And thank you for listening to BSing with Sean K on Radio Free Brooklyn. I'm Na Hussein for coming on 
thanks again to Dr. Omnum Hussein for coming on the show and sharing her knowledge with us and helping to guide us thanks to her and other you know healthcare specialists for guiding us through this crisis and it didn't sound like it's she thinks it's going to be over any time soon like it, it'll be over super soon but at least she's saying that this isn't going to be forever and hopefully i'm hoping like the end of the summer this should be done but yeah they, they, they originally said like may things would open up but you know as long as, i think we'll get through this and I, i'm happy that I'm more fortunate right now than a, a lot of other people. Even some people I know are. And, well, you know, it's, I don't know, it might be a whole new world once this is over. So, we'll see. And you can keep updated with Dr. Amna Hussein on her Instagram. Dr. Dr. Amna Hussein. That's Dr. A M N A. H U S A I N on Instagram. If you want to keep updated with future episodes of BSing with Sean K, you can check me out on Spotify, on iTunes, BSing with Sean K, or also SeanNeese.com, S E A N K N E E S E.com, or on RadioFreeBrooklyn.com or the Radio Free Brooklyn mobile app. I air My show airs every Monday, 1 a.m. to 2 a.m., which is technically like late Sunday night. And you can also follow me on Instagram, uh, S-K-N-E-E-S-E-1989. That's my Instagram handle. Or even if you want to look me up on Facebook, that's cool too, Sean Neese. Uh, Yeah, that's about it for this week's episode. And I'll catch you on the next one. Hey.